This is the Mobile Tech Podcast, brought to you by worldpodcasts.com. Now here's your host, Tank Girl, Miriam Joie. Brought to you by Audible. Stay tuned for a special offer at the end of the show. Hi and welcome to the Mobile Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Miriam Joie, and today is Thursday, October 29th, 2020, and my guest is the one and only Chris Velasco of Engadget. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm really good, Miriam. I missed you. Oh, I miss you too. Ah, man. Good times when we used to like go to events and stuff. It was. Oh, uh, yeah. It's always also just nice to hang out with a fellow senior mobile editor emeritus. <laughs> That's right. X and Gadget. There's a pretty decent club now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The editor at large. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Dana to make me editor at large just, just on paper. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we talked about the iPhone for like three shows now. This is the third one. But I actually haven't had a person on my show that has had an iPhone in their hands yet. And I haven't bought one or ordered one yet. I'm obviously going to eventually. But, you know, my publications are not that interested in publishing stuff on the iPhone or I have already got it covered. And right. personally, for my podcast, I've got it covered. For my channel, I'm not going to get the page views, you know, if I publish at the same time as everyone else, right? So I'm generally better off. I don't know about that, but yeah, sure. You know, I'm better off waiting, getting the phone maybe, you know, on a sale in Thanksgiving or something, and then doing some sort of like, you know, three months later review or something. So all this to say, I don't have one. And I would love to hear from you who's actually like, had to marathon review this thing. Like, <laughs> I'm feeling very excited about this phone like from everything i've read from everyone and i want to know is this exciting and warranted do you feel this is enough of a a bump up you know how the 11 was such a, a defining phone for apple like it really brought them back in photography in many many places right mm -hmm. technically i think it was a strong phone is the 12 that as well I mean, it's undeniably a strong phone, but I think its value is only it's highly contingent on where you're coming from, right? Like, I think it's in my experience, at least the 11 Pro and Pro Max were, was one of the few occasions where if you had bought an iPhone the year before, there was a pretty compelling argument to buy this one. And honestly, I expected that to be the case with the 12 and 12 Pro, two lovely devices that I've really enjoyed using. But Obviously, if you're coming from, I don't know, like an 8 or an 8 Plus or earlier or an iPhone 10, that's when the, the benefits that Apple's packed into these two devices really start to feel more apparent. Yeah, that makes sense. I've, I mean, obviously, we're still waiting for two more iPhones. We're going to talk about some uh, iPhone mini leaks that are out there from people somehow publishing stuff they're not supposed to. <laughs> Good for <laughs> us. Uh, but um, I'm just wondering, like, it's for me, honestly, as an imaging uh, kind of, you know, focused person... I want to, my gut draws me this year towards the, you know, the 12 Pro Max or the Maxi, as I've been calling it. 12 Maxi, <laughs> 12 Mini, you know, it's easy. Um, but I feel like, I feel like I can't really justify, you know, as somebody who's not going to get a review in it, buying this phone. It's so expensive. So you obviously haven't played with those yet. But when it comes to the regular 12 and 12 Pro, and obviously I expect, you know, we can extrapolate to the mini, which has mm -hmm. the exact same camera system as the 12. Do you feel that there's enough of a, a, a difference between the 11 and the 12? Like I have an 11 regular right now as my video phone that I use for video content, B-roll and stuff. Right. Do you feel this is enough of an improvement for the, the tech savvy early adopter audience that I have here to actually pull the trigger and do that update, you know, where Apple lets you like trade in your phone, you know? Right. If we're so if we're taking Pro Max off the table because no one's as far as I'm aware actually used one of these things. Yeah. If we're talking purely 12 and 12 Pro, I gotta say, at least where the camera's concerned, probably not. I did a lot of uh, comparison testing between uh, last year's 11 Pro and this year's 12 and 12 Pro, and in most situations, the way Apple's Smart HDR tends to handle situations with lighting and color and sort of dynamic range and and night shots as well, it's it's a pr it's almost a dead even heat between the two. Now, that's not to say there aren't edge cases where the 12 and 12 Pro will do a little better, but 
on the whole, I wouldn't say it's a dramatic increase. And and that might change, right? Because you're we're expecting to see improvements like Apple introducing Pro Raw for the yeah. iPhone 12 Pro series this year. That's just not available yet. So that might actually be a great reason for people who really, really care about photography to invest in the Pro line. But as it stands right now, if you've got a fairly recent iPhone, I mean, if you've got an iPhone 11, you're probably fine. But again, if you're coming from something earlier, the, the difference is oh, really, yeah. really impressive. I would say that if you come from any of the 10 series iPhones even it's like it was already a huge jump to the 11 imaging wise I think the 12 would be would be you know probably a good a good purchase you know yeah I gotta say though I was a little so the Apple made a couple improvements to some of the night stuff uh if you've got a pro for example it'll help use lidar at night to sort of help with focus and and with sort of night portraits I I gotta say some of the night stuff did feel a little disappointing to me and I think I, I haven't been able to confirm this with Apple or, or really anyone, but I, I sort of suspect the the new seven element lens Apple is using in these iPhones might not be doing it a ton of favors. Oh, the lens flare! I'm not? getting a lot of nighttime lens flare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't get a chance to dig into this too much in my review because, as you say, it's a total marathon situation, and you you get to what you can get to and hope you do a good enough job with it. <laughs> it's like you publish and you oh I forgot about that detail. <laughs> oh my you God, know? Miriam, you know exactly how yeah. this goes. It's su- writing a review under an embargo is so strange. Especially an <laughs> Apple review. Oh my God. An Apple review under embargo is, is brutal. Um, but you know, it's interesting because to me, what sticks out about the imaging system on the phones you've reviewed, I mean, obviously the, the Maxi has the crazy, uh, you know, in-body stabilization madness that we're all looking forward to trying out, right? right. But I think for me, what stands out on the regular phones is, is the F of 1.6 lens. That's like, there's very few companies who've gone down that low. Like, Huawei has with the P40 and P30s and Mate 30 mm-hmm. and Mate 40 series on some of their models, not all of them. Uh, 1.6 is hard to do. And the first company who did it and who did it well, and you know, we can never, we always treat them like garbage because they keep making garbage phones, but they have so much <laughs> in-house expertise. It's LG. LG was the first to do F1.6 and to gather so much light, right? And I think that when I saw that, my like my, you know, my eyebrows raised, and I was like, "Oh my God, Apple's doing f of one point six, yes!" You know, like toot toot. It was exciting, <laughs> you know. Right. So um, that's I think what we're seeing. Like, there, I don't think the sensors are radically different, and I think because of that, the processing on the, you know, there's probably some slight improvements here and there. But I feel like the F of 1.6 is what just gives it that little edge and no light. But I think I agree with you. A lot of that uh, kind of portrait night photography and stuff is very gimmicky. I reviewed the Pixel 5 that also has portrait night photography now. Mm-hmm. And honestly, it comes out so crunchy. Like, it works. Yeah. Yes, it's there. You did it. Woohoo. But like, uh, do you want to keep these photos? Look at them objectively. They don't even resemble anything close to a DSLR. Like, exactly. we're not even in that realm yet, right? Miriam, I want to ask you, actually, since we're talking about cameras, uh, and, and now we've brought Pixel 5 into the mix, too. So I, I've reviewed the iPhones and the Pixel 5, and I feel like I spend so much of my reviews, my written reviews now, at least, talking about sort of the different vibes that these companies are chasing, these aesthetics yeah. that they seem to want to imbue their photos with. Do you have a preference? Like, I feel like Apple's is generally, it skews very realistic with some slight sort of modifications to make it feel a little more appealing. This year, the Pixel 5 has felt super... I mean, there were always kind of moody photos, right? Sort of yeah. warmer colors this year, lots of contrast to kind of give you that sort of subdued, uh, almost like Renaissance painting style look. I'm a big fan of the Pixel, I have to say. Although I'm not a fan of the 5 this year, I feel like, you know, I don't want to get into a 5 review here on the air. We've reviewed sure. it like <laughs> so to death now. But I just feel like, you know, the phone, I feel, was a miss in terms of pricing primarily. And the camera doesn't really move forward that much. But I love the aesthetic of the pics. Like if I have like I have basically on in my bag at all times, although not that I'm traveling, but somehow my bag is still packed and ready to go like it used to be because I used to travel so much. So in my work bag, I have an iPhone 11 right now and a Pixel 4 XL, although I will probably put the Pixel 5 in there instead because I want the ultra wide as my imaging phones like basically if i have to take a critical photo it's the pixel and if i have to take a critical video it's the iphone and that's how i'm playing it 
Now, don't get me wrong, because the 11 complemented the Pixel 4 so well, because it has the ultra-wide and the Pixel mm-hmm. 4 has the telephoto, I might actually keep the Pixel 4 in there because the telephoto, and I've taken a lot of ultra-wide shots I've used for press stuff, like for my, for my, uh, for my publications, uh, with the 11, because it has the ultra-wide, and I know I always have one with me, right? Um, oh, yeah. Because then the phone's in my pocket. My main phone is a OnePlus 8 Pro, which... I have to say, imaging-wise, is another one of my favorites, surprisingly. Like, there's not enough love and appreciation of what OnePlus was able to pull off with that IMX 689 48-megapixel 1.12 micron, like, per 48-megapixel. If right. you, you know, when you pixel bin that thing, you get 2.24 micron pixels. It's insane. NOIS, and they've polished their image processing. I feel that, like... I could just live with that camera, the OnePlus 8 Pro. But the 8 and the 8T, which also I don't want to get into reviewing again because we've I done know, it. I know, I <laughs> know. But, but, but I feel like those, that, that IMX586 is a phenomenal sensor, but it's it's two years old now. And, yeah. and like, you know, it's like we can only do so much with it. And then uh, OnePlus keeps putting what I call these sticker cameras. Basically, mm-hmm. they should be stickers on the back because they're completely useless. They're just there for camera count. You know, hey, that color filter camera was was the color a filter trip. was cool, but that's on the eight Pro. I'm talking about the eight and yeah, eight T yeah, yeah. that have the stupid macro, right? Remember, the eight Pro did it right. The eight Pro had a macro that uses the ultra wide with autofocus. That's mm-hmm. that's how the seven T did it. How did <laughs> how did one plus? We're going to talk about one plus, but how did one plus go back? Like they went backwards from where they were with the seven T with the eight and the eight T. You know, yeah. Yeah. We'll definitely get to this in a little bit, but it very much feels like, you know, the classic OnePlus, right? The ones that we sort of used to get really excited about because they were working on the proper, you know, quote unquote flagship killer devices. It feels just so strongly that they've, com- they've compromised on so many of their principles. And it kind of like it, the company almost feels unrecognizable now for, for a lot of yeah, reasons, yeah. including staffing ones. But if you ask me, my kind of muse, my kind of like, if I look at imaging, yes, the iPhone solid, absolutely a reference, especially for video, especially mm-hmm. front facing camera video. Um, but then you have, you know, the pixels are oh, super solid in, in all kinds of conditions with a really good spread of price ranges that Pixel 4a at, at 350. If I had to have a cheap budget phone today, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that would be the phone in my pocket. Like hands right. down, like no ifs or buts. It doesn't matter. Even if I lived in freaking Hong Kong where I could get all the <laughs> Oppos and Vivos and Xiaomi's of the world, there's no doubt I would have that phone in my pocket. But... The muse, my little muse, is been Huawei with a P40 Pro Plus. Chris, if you Ooh, haven't, yeah, yet, I haven't tried it yet. It's a you beaut- need to spend a week or two casually, not necessarily even reviewing it for work. Like, go out there, just use it as a second phone, set up with Microsoft apps so you can get your Outlook and your emails, and right. Twitter works, Instagram works, all that stuff works. You're just gonna miss the Google stuff, but oh my god pictures to die for like you know it's like we look at it we think the p30 pro was kind of like that incredible you know bump up in terms of imaging and that they Mm -hmm. did they stayed still after that they did not like every software update is better and it's like you're like what like this shows you if google had good hardware what they could do with software because the hardware on these phone imaging hardware is so strong that then that you know Huawei just keeps cranking the dial up to eleven further and and just extracting more data from that sensor, and I've talked to Uber at uh, Uber Gizmo, you know mm-hmm. who has this new uh, hardware and uh, hardware quality and I image quality yeah, yeah. rating and stuff. He's basically competing with DxO now, and honestly, if I'm going to trust someone, <laughs> it's going to be Uber over DxO be that any day. <laughs> um, but you know him and I, he we're neighbors. He lives five blocks from me, so we we talk. No kidding. And. We are all in agreement on the fact that Huawei still freaking owns it in imaging. I mean, even their video has gotten good now. Like iPhone, like iPhone still wins video. Like I don't know what iPhone's doing for special sauce, but if I was a filmmaker or a video like a like a Michael Fisher, like I would absolutely use the iPhone. Like there's no doubt. Even the Huawei doesn't touch it yet. But <laughs> if you're just a casual person who does a little bit of video, but you really want the best photos, man, like. The Huawei phones. And so I just, I literally just 10 minutes before we started the podcast, received the Mate 40 Pro, regular, not plus, oh, hey uh, from DHL. 
So folks, you are listening, stay tuned because I'm obviously kind of looking forward to seeing what they did. They did downgrade some stuff on that. The ultrawide is no longer 40 megapixel, it's a 20. And let's see what that pans out because I've never seen ultrawide photos as good as the Huawei's. The, the Mate 30 Pro and the P40 Pro and P40 Pro Plus as well mm -hmm. have, get this, a 40 megapixel pixel binned ultrawide. <laughs> and it's really good. You know, the other thing, that's the other reason that I think the OnePlus 8 Pro is an unsung hero. It has a 586 as its ultra wide. Yeah, that is really nice. Like, that, you're right, it doesn't really get enough credit, but that is a so really good. great all around phone. And, and it's used for the macro too. So they've put out a focus on it. And when you get close to something, it uses the autofocus on the ultra wide to get you that. It crops as well because it has 48 megapixels to play with. So it's very, very clever. It's kind of a combination of what Samsung does with the S20 and zooming, you know, like anyway. And then the telephoto, the telephoto is the only weak spot on the 8 Pro, I think. But speaking of telephotos, the P40 Pro Plus, which you really need to ask uh, the folks <laughs> at Huawei, just, just on principle to send you one. First of all, ceramic back, like it's just so nice. And then two telephotos, a 3x optically stabilized and a 10x a real optical 10x Woof. stabilized and both are 8 megapixels doesn't seem like much they have really good f-stops for their crazy optical depth like a uh, zoom level the 10x on this is like you can zoom up to like <laughs> 30x without loss of image <laughs> quality like it's it's like it's like having like a seventy two twenty on a on a on a DSL. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, that's you know? wild. And and I mean, in, in, it falls apart at, in low light because the you know the sensors are not as good as in low light, and the f stops are a little high. And also, of course, you know, uh, when you zoom in digitally too much, you start cropping. You know, start having to deal with this digital zoom, right? Mm -hmm. uh, hybrid zoom, whatever you want to call it. That's where I think Samsung is another hung, hung sung hero. I think the not the S20 Ultra, but the Note 20 Ultra? Holy crap. I, this is the only Samsung phone that stayed in my pocket for more than a month in the last three years. It's no kidding, so good. really? If you ask to ask me right now, pick a phone with a telephoto that kicks ass, I will say, oh, no doubt about it. It's either the, I'll pick the Samsung Galaxy Note 20 Ultra or the P40 Pro Plus. They're pretty much a wash. They can both take 30x zoom photos that don't suck. Right. The S20 Ultra is... It's got some issues. <laughs> like, yeah, I just I, don't I, like it. We've, I think we've all quickly written off the S20 Ultra yeah. as a thing. I mean, no, but the thing is, you know, also it's sad because the S20 Ultra had to happen for the Net No 20 Ultra to happen. Like from a oh, for sure. from an evolutionary point of view, from a software and hardware improvement point of view. But I think Samsung has learned that using a large sensor and cropping it for telephoto is not the way to go. Like you know how they did the base S20, S20 plus that I've using like, what is a 64 megapixel as a zoom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the, if you look at the optical no, zoom, just, it's only 1.1 X or something. like. It's so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> so what, well, my point is that, yeah, Huawei is still, um, is still kicking serious butt. And the other thing that the people don't realize, and I didn't mention on the podcast last week when we talked about the Mate 40 Pro because it had just been announced. I didn't realize this until after the show. It has dual front-facing cameras if you count the time-of-flight sensor in that little oval pill. Oh, I didn't realize. They got an ultra-wide for the selfies. So, Do you do you find much value in an ultra-wide no, selfie but, camera? But, but if I had to have a single camera in the front, I'm not a selfie person, but I have same. to agree. Big time same. Yeah. I mean, but I have to agree after talking to some folks that are really into selfies that an ultra wide is preferred, right? Like that's, that's it. They want an ultra wide and they also want, they also want autofocus and OIS. So, you know, there's so no phone does that. They're like, no phone has OIS and an, and an autofocus and an ultra wide right now. There's some that have autofocus, like the pixel three XL had autofocus on its main front camera, not the ultra wide. Right. There is, you remember the, oh man, you're going to go down history lane. Cause you and I love to do that. Do you remember the HTC desire? I, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. You went there. Sorry, yes. Whoops. Thank you. My bad. The Desire Eye, <laughs> the Desire Eye was... Yeah, I mean, it had identical front and back cameras, right? Correct. I think oh, the, the lens was slightly different in terms of like width or optics or f-stop. I believe I mean, that's right, that, yeah. The sensor, and I think they both had OIS. If I'm wrong on the OIS, definitely the HTC, I want to say the 10 or the 11, the 10, HTC 10 had OIS autofocus on the main front lens. Oh, it had only one front lens, so... God, I barely remember that phone. Poor HTC. <laughs> 
It was a good I, phone. I loved it at the time, but it's just like it, it left no mark in my consciousness. It was, I, I, it was the HTC phone that, that, that was the beginning of falling off the cliff. Like it basically, it's the HTC phone we all caught as it was falling off the cliff and reviewed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. God, what year was that? Was that 2018? 17? No, 16. It all blurs together at I want to say 16, 16 or 17. Yeah, you might be right about that. It's a while ago now. Anyway, so so that's my my uh, kind of imaging state of the art analysis. Um, let's go back to the iPhones a bit. Do you, anything else that for you stood out that were like you know you review all the phones, especially the iPhones every year, like something that stood out? You were like, oh, I was I wasn't expecting this. Well done, Apple. I mean, the one if I have to pick one thing that really sort of stayed at the back of my head while I was working on those reviews is honestly just how close these phones are. The gap between a non-pro iPhone and a pro iPhone, at least at this point in time before Apple has completely implemented everything on the camera side that it wants to, it very much seems like there's little reason to buy an iPhone 12 Pro right now. If you care about the cameras, you wait for the Max. If you just want a good phone that doesn't cost a ton of money, there is the iPhone 11, which in my opinion, at least, beats up just about everything in that price. I can't, I, maybe you, I would love to hear your opinion on this. I don't know that I have another phone in that sort of seven seven fifty price range that I would put in the same category as the iPhone 12. It's hard. It's hard. I don't think there's much. I mean, basically, it in terms of imaging, um, hmm. Uh, I suppose that it depends on your priorities. If video is your thing, iPhone all the way. Actually, all if video way, is yep. your thing, screw, stop screwing around, buy an iPhone SE, okay? Like, seriously. <laughs> like, you save yourself some money. Like, you get really good video out of the SE. No, no better, honestly, than the 10R. And at that point, you're almost at the 11 in terms of video performance. And at that point, you're almost at the 12. So if you're just looking at video, I think buy an iPhone SE. But if you're looking at stills, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff. At, was it $799 for the base iPhone? Or was it? I believe so. I'd have to double check. No, nah, it's okay. At that price, you're now looking at the pixels, of course. Um, some of them, the old ones and the new ones. Like, right. you, you can buy a Pixel Four for cheaper. You can buy a Pixel Five for six ninety nine, and those are pretty damn competitive. Yeah, you know, I still feel like I'd buy a Pixel Four XL over a Five at this point. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. And and it all depends on your priorities. If you want a telephoto or you want an ultra wide, right? So on the iPhone Twelve, you're stuck with the ultra wide. You don't get the telephoto unless you spend. You know, yeah, I think it's yeah, a two hundred dollar, two hundred bucks. Yeah, 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 so it is seven ninety nine because yeah, the other one's nine ninety nine. Okay, so again, I don't think it's quite in the same league as those two, but it's a very complete camera system in terms of its breadth of hardware and software capabilities. Uh, One Plus Eight Pro. I, I'm talking, thinking U.S. market here. Now, if you yeah. go abroad, like you have a bunch of Xiaomi's and Huawei's, oh, yeah. because the, sure. look, the the Mate and the P series are all around that price in abroad. If you go to England right now, you can buy a P40 Pro non-plus for about seven, eight, 700, 800 bucks mm -hmm. because they've come down in price a little bit. So, I mean, for those people who don't care about GMS and all that stuff, that's an option for them. But like the Mi, the Mi 10T series that I just released from Xiaomi is kind of like their, you know, TikTok cycle for the year. They have the Mi 10 and right. the T10T. Last year was 9 and 9T. So the T is the cheaper version. They take all the features from the, the flagship earlier that year and kind of distill them and cut a few corners here and there and distill them into something a little more affordable. And well, uh, the 10 is the 10T series are pretty freaking solid. Like, I think the 10T Pro is probably in that same, a little bit less and probably delivers similar photos. Um, yeah. And then you got, uh, let's see, you know who I was really impressed with recently with photography images is Oppo. Oppo has just learned to make good cameras. And I think that's also why OnePlus is making decent cameras. I think they got all this from Oppo, actually. You know, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like the Oppo Find X2 Pro, which I reviewed back in... In March, right? I, I was supposed to I was supposed to get my review in it at Mobile World Congress and Oppo was my sponsor <laughs> and they were gonna fly me out to Barcelona and then they had to cancel out. And that phone is essentially a OnePlus eight Pro with a right. folded telephoto five X lens, you know? I remember being very jealous when those reviews started going out because like, man, I really wanted to try that thing. 
it's the same display as the 8 Pro. It's the same camera system other than the telephoto being better on the Fine X2 Pro. And it also has like a vegan leather back and it's super premium. The only reason that's not my daily driver right now over the, one eight, the OnePlus 8 Pro is because it doesn't have wireless charging. Really? Yeah. That, that was the deal breaker for you. I thought you were going to say Color OS. I know. Or Oppo is just weird. Like, I think the BBK group is really weird about that. And, and again, I, I'm not sure I would put that phone in the same category as the iPhone mm. 12 because it's a $1,200 phone. When it came out, it was expensive as hell, even abroad. Right. Because it's oh, yeah. positioned as a premium device. But I bet you you can buy it cheap now. Also, the standout that I talked about last week, the standout phone for me that kind of came out of nowhere, imaging-wise, is really, really good, but it's not like what you expect it to be. And also much cheaper, like much, we're talking 600 bucks, 700 bucks. Yeah. is the Vivo X50 Pro, the gimbal phone. Oh, God, right. Now, yeah. it's not because of the gimbal that I'm saying this. Like, the gimbal is cool, but it's a gimmick. Like, ultimately, it's just OIS on steroids. Uh, for video, it's buggy enough that I wouldn't even recommend it. But, get what? The, the, a lot of people will know this. This phone has an ultra-wide as well, and has two telephotos, like the P40 Pro. It has a 2X and a 5X folded lens. Right. So for 600 or 700 bucks, you get four cameras that are real, really useful cameras on the back and they don't suck. And Vivo's, again, Vivo's image processing, I mean, this is the first Vivo phone that, in my opinion, takes any photos that are worth anything. <laughs> like it's just, you know, like, yeah, it's pretty bad. But, um, but the gimbal is super impressive. Like you can take handheld long exposures in, man in pro mode, like manual, like actually not using image stacking, but like using, you know, a long open shutter handheld because that, that gimbal is just constantly just like... Yeah, God, that's cool. It can do half an inch. Like you can literally move the phone like this and it doesn't move on the screen. And if you look, if you're facing the phone, you look at it, mm. you can see the gimbal. Like, woo, 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 woo. <laughs> it's so crazy. It's amazing. I know. So our, our good friend Richard Lai, because of how Engadget sort of distributes yeah, yeah. You, its you staffers. Yeah, you got Richard for that stuff. We got, we got good old Richard Lai in Hong Kong playing with all this fun stuff. And every, every once in a while, he just publishes a review or a hands-on or a story. And I'm just like, <laughs> God damn it, Richard. Come on, let me have one once. Let me have some fun. Yeah, that's the problem. I'm uh, kind of very uh, lucky that way because I've been doing a lot of the Chinese phone reviews for mm -hmm. Android Police. So I got access to a lot of really cool Chinese phones because of it. And it's, it's kind of cool because, you know, you get a completely different perspective. Like, Oh, for sure. And it, it's a great reminder of just how sort of established and, and sometimes stagnant the U.S. smartphone market is, right? Like you've yeah. got two, maybe three players worth their salt that just like continually play at the high levels. And then you rarely get to see anyone do anything really cool aside from like LG doing crazy stuff with the wing or something. Oh, man, I love the wing. I, I, I love it. It's so flawed, but I love it. I cannot not love it. Like That's exactly it's, it's the I kind of too. phone that every time I flip it open, I'm like, I put a smile on my face and I, I yeah. want to say, you know, I, was, I want to say F it, F it. This is a great phone. It's not a great phone, but I, <laughs> it's not a bad phone. It's just like, here's my, my take on the wing. I, I mean, I'm in the middle of reviewing it for hot hardware, but I feel like if you have money and you like to change phones every six months, like a lot of the people listening to this podcast probably do, like go for it. Just live with it for six months. It's not a bad phone. And it is so freaking different and cool. Like it's almost worth it. Of course, you have to be on Verizon in the US for that. But if you are like, you know, I did some millimeter wave speed tests. We finally got millimeter wave in San Francisco. Woohoo! Oh, I saw that. Yeah, congrats. And oh my God, it's fast. It's fast. So if you have to download like something or upload, or you, if you're a YouTube creator and you have to upload a video, just put it on your phone, walk to the <laughs> street corner at the lamppost and go upload and see if the YouTube service can keep up. <laughs> yeah, know? I'm working on my review of the wing right now. And I'm doing the video kind of all the way through myself, which is nice and fun and something I never get to do. But I, I cannot sort of echo your sentiment enough. Like it is not, objectively speaking, it is not a polished, great phone. But goddamn, I haven't had more fun with you know, a device in a really long time. I uh, just shot, you know, we, we I want to actually tell the audience this. We, um, my producer and I created a second channel called Mobile Tech More on YouTube. So Mobile Tech Podcast is the main channel and Mobile Tech More is the kind of like, let's review weird stuff like blenders and robot vacs and whatever oh, nice. else they want to send us that's really bizarre. And so my producer, I'm very proud of them. They created and uh, directed, edited, and produced their first, uh, second, I think, video 
and it's a four blender. Okay, so so check out the channels Mobile Tech More. Just type Mobile Tech More in YouTube because it's a brand new channel, so we can't have a custom <laughs> URL yet. But the point I'm making is I shot that entire thing. I, they directed me, but I shot it with the LG Wing in gimbal. Oh, mode. no kidding. Yeah. Yeah. The gimbal mode, I mean, the quality of the video out of the gimbal mode is a little crunchy because it does a lot of software processing, right? Because it's all software-based gimbal. Right. But damn, it's good. It's so fun. Like you hold the phone. It's the perfect form factor almost, you know? All right. I just subscribed, by the way. I got to watch this oh, Blender video you. when yeah, we're we, done. We, if, you listen, if you're listening false, please take a second right now. Go to youtube.com, type in Mobile Tech More and subscribe because if we can get 100 subscribers today, then we will be able to name the channel and get a URL. So we have got everything else under control, but that's one thing. And eventually when we get a thousand subscribers, we'll be able to monetize. So it'll be great. But look, check it out. I think it's cool. I still think that the, you know, in the context of what we're talking about, the LG wing for video, this gimbal thing is gimmicky, but it's not gimmicky. Like it actually, you know, the only thing I wish the gimbal did, and I think they can't because it's not a hardware gimbal like the Vivo, mm-hmm. is that zooming. I wish there was a zoom slider on the controls. Yeah, because yeah, I can but see they that. They can't because they're already cropping, so it would look really crunchy, really bad, really fast, right? God bless those guys. They're such weirdos, and I love them so see, much. This is what it. I'm saying. It's like, ah, forget the Velvet and the V60. Like, they're boring. I mean, the Velvet is a beautiful phone. Certainly. But it's not a, like, the wing has OIS on the main lens, and I'm still not forgiving LG for removing OIS on the Velvet. Because it's mm-hmm. like, it's already an iffy camera, and you removed OIS. Like, oh. Whereas, you know, the V60 at least has OIS. But the V60 is boring. Like, if you're going to get an LG phone right now, the wing, all the way, 100%. Yeah, what else could you possibly, rec- like, the Velvet is a perfectly adequate yeah. Good looking smartphone, yeah. but it's not remarkable no. in any way. Just no. live a little, get a wing, whatever. I, I said style over substance in my in my headline because it's really what it is. Totally. Um, anyway, let's go back quickly to the iPhone because we have a lot more to talk about. Yeah, we've taken like three or four different hard left turns. A couple of last things on the iPhone. There are there have been a, there have been some leaks of the um, the 12 mini side by side with the 12 and 12 Pro. I mean, there's not too much there. Like, obviously, you can go to Apple's website and see them side by side. But this is a, you know, video and it has, you know, well, there was a video. It's been taken down. There's some photos and basically it was a hands-on that leaked by accident. And I thought it was interesting enough. If you are somebody who wants a small phone, I think the 12 mini is going to be your phone, right? Nobody else can do a phone that good. What is the last good small smartphone? I'm thinking of like maybe an Xperia or something. Well, the but SE, other than that, but the SE is the SE, has a sure. lot of compromises for the price, right? Like it, the, it doesn't operate in the same right, class at exactly. all. Exactly. But this, I don't think anybody in the Android world is going to be able to top the 12 mini. Nobody can make a phone like that because there's no market for it. Yeah, I'm really, you know what, I, I'm on the verge of sort of loving the idea of this phone, but God, I need to know about the battery life. Battery life, oh, I gotta say, yeah. since we're talking, since we were talking about sort of 12 versus sort of earlier phones as well, this is one of the rare situations where the iPhone 11 was definitively better than the 12. Just because oh. you had that chunkier body, you just get better battery life. Interesting. And that's why people bought the phone. I know so many people who didn't, who put up with that like liquid retina, like perfectly fine LCD screen that Apple made that ran at a lower resolution because you had a phone that lasted for a day and a half, two days without too much fuss. And you just cannot do that with an iPhone 12. Ah, interesting. So if I, who has an 11 right now, were to go to the 12, I would notice is what you're saying. I, I think you would. And I think you would probably hate it. Yeah, that sucks. Oh, well, you know, so the mini should be challenging. Look, I'm still praising Apple for listening to their fans. They all want a small, this is smaller than the SE, technically. Just a hair, yeah. And has a bigger screen because it's, uh, you know, the new way, not the home (laughs) button way, which I mean, some people like, you know, Theo, my spouse, wanted the SE because they don't want to switch to the gestures. It's just freaking them out. And also, you know, they don't need more phone. So, I mean, you get a lot of phone with the SE. Wireless charging is super cool. They love it. Wireless charging. I still love the Touch ID sensor. Like, it's just so it's much more so useful fast. than Face ID I right know. now. So anyway, but uh, rounding up more iPhone 12 news, we also have a teardown of the 12 and 12 Pro. Um, I think there's been a bunch. I, I think iFixit did one, and I'm pretty sure that JRig Everything, I'm sure by now, has done one. Mm. And so what came out of those to me was interesting was you know, the reverse wireless charging, hidden reverse wireless charging. And and speaking of, what do you think of the, the MagSafe thing? Like this is, it's cool, right? It's cool, but I mean, so here's the thing. I I loved, and this is 
a little silly of me because it was not great most of the time. But I loved Moto mods. I love the idea <laughs> of being able to expand on the idea you of what's here without magnets, having Chris. I love well magnets. How do they work? I don't know. I still don't know. But the idea of the modular phone is still very near and dear to my heart. And Motorola was like. Aside from LG with the G5, Motorola was maybe the one company that like really took a stab at it. And so I loved the idea that maybe, just maybe, MagSafe sort of becomes the potential sort of smart connector equivalent for iPhones. As it turns out, that's not possible, at least for now, because there's no way to pass data between uh, a MagSafe connector well, and the is. phone there's itself. Well, there is. There's that ultra-wideband chip in there, remember? for uh, Sure, yeah. But that's, yeah, for that's true. AirDrop, that, that could be used for data transmission. Remember how the... Uh, was it what the essential phone did that too with its accessories it had physical contacts on the back for the power oh, but right the it was wireless usb remember that god barely essential i will say the one time i recently thought of essential was when i picked up the 12 pro for the first time yeah, yeah. because they're so like the the attention to detail and just the craftsmanship in both of those phones felt so so similar to me i love that that is like i think the iphone 4 aesthetic which is now back you mm. know i was saying this on the podcast last week but i really feel it's stronger and stronger every time i see it, another iphone 12 you know video on youtube from all of our creator friends is that the proportions of the 12 and 12 pro are perfect like they are brawn perfect they are like the four the five was too tall like the five was still good looking Mm-hmm. Five five S S E original S E. But the the width to height ratio somehow on the twelve and twelve pro golden rule. Like they're perfect. I really like them, but I so since I've since the review embargo is listed lifted, I've obviously like shown people the phones who haven't like gotten around to buying one yet or whatever. And I was honestly very surprised by the number of people who thought the iPhone twelve felt worse than the eleven because it sort of lacked the heft, which they sort of huh. knowingly are not equated with quality. Um, a couple people thought it was made of plastic, which I thought was particularly funny. That's but hilarious. yeah, like I, I agree with you. I think, I mean, and Apple has said in the past that like the 6.1 inch size and sort of building around that display size, that's the sweet spot. That's right. why they made the 10R and the 11 the size that they did. And that's why they sort of revamped it to make it work in these new designs. But it's, I think it's important to remember that like a lot of people do not approach this stuff the same way that we do. No. So uh, for Quite sure. a few people I know were like surprisingly disappointed by these things. Uh, what else did we find out from these uh, these teardowns? I'm trying to think. There is obviously a lot packed in these phones with the millimeter wave antennas on the US models. But overall, I feel like other than the reverse wireless charging that was revealed in an FCC thing, you know, it's a beautifully made phone. Like it's again, shows you what Apple can do. And it's just, man, they're so good at this stuff. So anyway, let's talk about something much cheaper. <laughs> Yes, please. Yeah, we talked about the uh, LG Wing and millimeter wave. I just got millimeter wave here. So five blocks from my house. It's nice. I can walk to it, test it out, come back. You know, it's it's convenient. I don't have to go downtown or anything. Is it? Would it be untoward to ask like what the the street corners are where where this is available? Well, I can totally tell you. It's uh, kind of like a Mission Bay neighborhood, which is where the UCSF oh, one yeah, of the okay. UCSF campuses is, where the mm. Chase Center is, the new stadium they built. Okay, so, yeah, that makes sense. So I live in Portrero Hill, so I just cross the freeway like and cross the railroad tracks, and I'm there basically. And I think the the corner I want to think is like 16th and. If you're at Benioff Children's Hospital, if you're right in front of Benioff mm-hmm. Children's Hospital, you'll get it. It's basically that simple. Yeah, that's really nice. I had to schlep to find it. There's a couple spots. I live in deep Brooklyn, and there's a oh, couple yeah. places sort of closer to Manhattan where it's technically available, and I found one. But, you know, one or two steps in the wrong direction meant the difference between 900 megabits down and like 80. Yeah, I bet. So I just reviewed for Geekspin a phone that's kind of boring on paper, the TCL 10 5G UW. God, these names, right? Like They're only getting worse. I can tell you right now that there's another one coming where the name is even worse. I can't oh, talk yeah, about it. Oh, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> You got I know what you're talking by this about. one. I, I think you know. It's like Verizon, please stop. Like, there's so many things that... Verizon's got to stop. Like the bloatware on this TCL phone. Oh my God. It's like 50 apps or something. I mean, it's ridiculous. I bought a Verizon Z, sorry, not to derail, but I bought a Verizon Z Fold 2 just just like have a foldable and like live with yeah, it yeah. and chew on it for a while. And I tried to uninstall like the Verizon preloaded like yeah, slot half of machine it app. Yeah. Either, either you can't uninstall these things or when you can, like in the case of the slot machine app, it just continually reinstalls. 
I know. It's, it's so just gross. Up. Anyway, so this phone is the cheapest 5G millimeter wave phone. The cheapest 5G phone up to now was a Revel 5G on T-Mobile. But of course, T-Mobile only has sub six. Well, they do have millimeter wave, but you know they don't push their millimeter wave much. So right. that, that Revel 5G from Timo, $400, is a sub six phone with mid and low band 5G on their stuff. It's a remake of the Moto 1 5G. It's just a custom, slightly detuned version of that phone. And speaking mm. of the Moto 1 5G, which is also reviewed on hard hardware, that is the cheapest AT&T sub six phone, and it's 449 well, so AT&T just today announced it's getting the LG K92 5G. I saw and that, speaking yeah. Speaking of terrible names, which I think with, uh, without a contract is like $395. So that's the new floor for AT&T Okay, so that's 5G the phone. new champion. So if you're on Verizon, you have another champion, and that's the phone I just talked about, the TCL 10 5G UW. And the reason it has that horrible name is because I'm sure Verizon imposed that upon the poor mm-hmm. folks at TCL. Poor Brad the things he has to deal with. (laughs) But, uh, you know, basically, look, it's the same as the 10L. Okay, let's rewind a bit. At CES, when we still made it to CES this year, the only thing we all did, um, there was three phones announced by TCL um, that were going to come to the US. The TCL 10L, 10 Pro, and 10 5G. The 10L is a $250 phone, Snapdragon 665, plastic, pretty much what you expect for a $250 phone. The 10 Pro is basically the same guts, but slightly better imaging and a super premium build and and like thin and OLED and in-display fingerprint sensor, all that. And then the 10 5G was basically, let's take the 10L and put 5G in it and a Snapdragon 765 and keep the, the kind of cheaper build and the cheaper specs otherwise to keep it down in price. And they said at CS it'd be below 500. And then it came out in Europe in the summer. And of course, we didn't see any of that in the US. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, Verizon announced that they picked it up for 400 US dollars with millimeter wave 5G. So you're getting millimeter wave, like gigabit speeds for $400 on this phone. So there you go. It's yeah, cool. it's a huge deal. And I, the, the millimeter wave stuff is undeniably great. I have my issues with the millimeter wave. Like, yeah, me it's too. Just... But now that I've actually used it, I'm like, okay, this is freaking cool. Like, I will not <laughs> say you should buy a phone with millimeter wave. I'm not at that stage yet. Certainly, you shouldn't switch to Verizon for it it's because the other carriers have it too. And eventually, all their phones will support all of it. But I think that it shows you know it shows us a future where COVID's gone. We're back in stadiums and concerts, and you know our phones are no longer working right now in LTE or even sub six five G. And now we would all have like incredible performance on our phones. Of course, it would kill our batteries a bit. But by then, I figure they'll solve that too, right? One would hope, yeah. Yeah. But I got to tell you, like, I and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, this is, is this not TCL's first, like, major carrier deal yeah. in the United yeah. States? Which is huge by itself because that takes so much work. Yeah. And kudos to them. Look, I think, you know, I don't, I understand, like, as I said, you know, I was talking to Brad yesterday and Messenger and I can't fault them for having to do whatever Ryzen tells them, right? What I'm mad about is Samsung and Moto bending over for for Verizon. Like mm. there are such big companies, they should just go like no. Like Samsung especially should be like no, no branding, no apps pre-installed, go away. This is you want the Z Fold 2? Of course you do. Don't fight us. Okay? <laughs> like like LG has no leg to stand on. I get it. Okay? And Do you think and, Moto has much of a leg to stand on? Well, I think they do a little more because but I think the problem with Moto is not that they don't have a leg to stand on, it's that they've been such a long time partner of, of Verizon, oh, yeah. right? Because like, mm-hmm. remember the Moto Mod 5G and like basically Qualcomm, Moto and Verizon are like a one unit almost. Like, oh yeah, you know what ever I'm since saying? the days of the droid. Yeah, no, since CDMA, remember that Qualcomm developed CDMA yeah. for Moto and for Verizon, which back then was called QWest or something else. I remember when it was not Verizon. Like basically they developed CDMA to compete with GSM for protectionist reasons because at the time they were worried that the Europeans having developed a quote unquote world standard would make them less competitive. So they decided to create their own fighting standard called CDMA. Like this is how messed up America is, is that every time something is developed somewhere else, instead of adopting it to make the world a better place, we go like, ha, 
no, we're going to make our own, just like a stubborn child having a tantrum, you know? It's <laughs> yeah, like... this brings me back. Now, I can't be mad overall because CDMA led the way to WCDMA, which is 3G on GSM, mm -hmm. right? The technology, like Qualcomm develops the technology. I can't fault them for that. Millimeter wave is absolutely the future of radio. It's just, at this point, not significant. But when you see a phone for $400 that doesn't suck... You know, you're like, oh, wow, maybe this is something I want to get. If you're a Verizon customer right now and you are bent on performance, the network performance, this is the phone to get. The only thing you're going to give up on this phone is imaging. Like the camera is okay in daylight, falls apart in low light, and it's basically as basically like a Moto G level camera, right? It's not great, but it's $400, whatever. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I agree with that to an extent. But here's here's my thing. If you're looking to buy a Verizon 5G phone right now, you're presumably on some level buying it because of the potential of millimeter wave, which until COVID finally starts to dissipate in like a meaningful way, like the circumstances of the world yeah. really seem to prevent you from taking you advantage of this. You don't need to take advantage of it in any way. So, so if millimeter wave is what you're using to decide whether or not you buy a phone, just save up and wait until the world unscrews itself. Yeah, exactly. And then, grit, and then get the best millimeter wave phone possible. And, and so here's my advice. My advice is if you're on Verizon right now, you're looking at this phone and you're not bent on the millimeter wave, but the $400 is really appealing to you, save an extra Benjamin, save an extra 100 bucks, go to Google's website, Buy a Pixel 4a 5G, unlocked, put it on Verizon. You won't get 5G on it. At least they could because it supports the band for their new sub-6 nationwide mm -hmm. 5G. The nationwide. But whether they will let you use that because they have their own version for $100 more than that with millimeter <laughs> wave, I don't think they'll let you use it. But put your SIM in there, you get 4G LTE, and you get a phone that is like vastly better in every way. Just for $100 more. I do more. love the 4a 5G, absolutely. So that's my feedback to the Verizon folks. And then if you're not on Verizon, it's a no-brainer. Go buy that Pixel 4a 5G, $100 <laughs> more. Again, a vastly superior phone that will give you 5G on AT&T and T-Mobile today. So that's my review of the TCL 10 5G UW, which is basically <laughs> go buy another phone. Sorry, Brad. Sorry, Brad. I mean, except for the millimeter wave. Wow, so good. Um, so anyway, uh, let me see. I've got a bunch of other little things. Okay, we're going to have to talk about OnePlus because, man, Circle they're back. pissing me off right now. <laughs> we talked about this a bit before the recording, but I just want to hear you go off again. Well, listen, I mean, I've just, my, probably in the third or fourth podcast where I've been scratching my head about OnePlus because, like, what the hell are they smoking over there? Look, I'm a big fan, and I think the 70 last year is still one of my, like, the for the money that thing was unbelievable and i kind of feel one plus like i think that they looked at their bill of materials and that a 17 were like wow that we didn't make a lot of money on that phone like it is such a good phone for the money mm. hardware and software in every way so then the 8 comes out to me it's a step down from the 70 other than the the newer chip and the 5g camera wise it's a step down right and you don't get much more. I mean, 90 hertz, had, the 7T had 90 hertz, so, you know. And then you look at the 8 Pro, and the 8 Pro is really it. The 8 Pro is like, okay, we're making a phone. Like, get out of the way, right? So that's why it's my daily driver. And honestly, I have no issues with Oxygen 11. I've used it now. It's fine. So then we get the Nord, and the Nord is just blew my mind. Lovely yeah, it's phone. A like, the Nord as it exists abroad is an impeccable example of OnePlus at its best. But again, I think they're looking at that phone, looking at their bill of material going... Like the 7T, we're not making money on this. <laughs> and so now we're, they, they, they're slipping on that slippery slope. They brought us the 8T. The 8T is a solid, great phone, but it brings nothing to the table that the 8 doesn't really have. Yes, you don't get the curved edge display, which I, you know, I don't like curved edges. So yes, that's nice. Yeah, but would you spend $150 more than what the 8 costs right now? Okay, on <laughs> Absolutely sale. not. Come on. For 120 hertz, for 30 hertz more, and for a non-curved edge display, no. And you're going to say, well, it comes with 12 gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of storage. Okay, the storage is great. The 12 gigs of RAM, I have yet to max out the RAM on an 8 gig <laughs> OnePlus phone. Okay, like, sorry to tell you, you don't need it. So I'm surprised that the base 8T has 12 gigs. I think that they went crazy on the spec of the chips and the performance and the speed side, and then they kept the cameras at the 8 level in less than the 7T level 
And it's a lopsided phone because it's a really great phone. Don't get me wrong. Every time I use my 8T, I'm like, oh, yes, so fast. <laughs> like, it's like my 8 Pro, right? Like, it's so fast. But then I'm like, uh, you know, why is the camera so mad? For, for the right. kind of money, it's like the Pixel 5. It's too expensive for what it is. It's not enough phone for the price, But for then sure. we hear about this Nord N10 5G and the Nord 100. Now, we've heard rumors of this forever. Now we have specs. And... I'm worried. Like, don't get me wrong. I think they can squeak by with the N10 5G because 90 hertz. And I have a feeling like Qualcomm has been kicking butt. Like, I reviewed the Poco X3 NFC with Snapdragon 732G, 4G chip. That 732G, Chris, I kid you not, is as fast as the 765. I believe it. It is holy crap fast. And so with optimized software, it's a pleasure to use. And that's also 120 hertz phone, the Poco X3 NFC. So the point I'm making is that if the 690 reaches, say, 720 level of performance, Snapdragon 720G, then I think we're, we, we have a leg to stand on because Oxygen OS is so smooth and so silky and so nice. And then we have a 90 hertz display. And at a price point, that is more affordable than the regular Nord. But you, you see what they cut, right? Like the rear fingerprint sensor, I love it. It's going to be great because it's fast and instantaneous. Sure. You can reach in your pocket, unlock it as you pull it out. But it looks like a phone that's two years old. That's my gripe <laughs> for the Pixel 5. It's like... <sighs> Do what Poco does. Put the freaking fingerprint sensor in the in the power lock key. It's much more modern looking. Like, you know? It's not even just modern looking. It's, to me, just infinitely more helpful. Yeah. So that's basically my takeaway for that one. I think I'm getting the intent to review pretty soon. And I think it'll be solid. But it's not that much of a price difference. You know, we don't know the price in the US, but it's 50 euros or 50 pounds difference between the regular yeah. Nord and that. Like, that's right. Why? Like, I'm even surprised that phone even made it to Europe. Like, like you'd think that US would be their first objective here, but like, mm -hmm. you know, because the 8 is with the carriers, right? And the 8 has a version for Verizon that's millimeters. So they can't really bring the Nord as it is today to the US because it's too close. Because the Nord is, is basically a uh, one plus eight with a 765 basically mm. you know <laughs> so i think that the nord n10 should have come to the us first like the fact that they're selling 50 dollars like in some markets like india that makes sense but like europe like are people not going to be able to spend an extra 50 euros uh, yeah i don't get it just the, their entire approach to the mid-range stuff uh, frankly if it was up to me i would i would keep the, they would make the nord the regular nord that we've sort of experienced already and then that's it like, don't bother going down market below that because at that point, you're just, as you pointed out earlier, you're looking at your bill of materials, you're deciding what compromises to make. And at some point, the compromises just aren't worth making those trade-offs. And I feel like that's especially what's going on with the N100, which we'll get to in a sec. Um, no, perfect segue. I was just going to get to that. Exactly my concern with that. I want to believe, like, I want to believe that OnePlus can make a $200 phone, $250 phone, that blows, I, I know they can make a phone that will blow away a Moto G, but a Moto G has a 600 series chip. This mm -hmm. is a 460. It doesn't have 90 hertz, which they promised us. I hate companies that make promises and like, we, you know, we'll never get rid of the headphone jack. Oh, sorry. Here's a OnePlus uh, 6T with a <laughs> headphone jack. Like we all knew it was coming, but like, why do you like make promises? You know, I don't know. Like the N100, I'm not even sure we'll get review units. Like, at this point, who knows? Yeah, I mean, it's it's far and away the least interesting, but also the most interesting because to yeah. me it has the Can most potential to be. Yeah, I I frankly am not convinced. And even if they do, to what what counts as a win for OnePlus here, right? Like they've been able to work in they they started out making sort of more affordable versions of flagships, and maybe they didn't make as much off each device, but they built a lot of great goodwill that way. Now, as you try to take that formula and move it down market. Like so many, so much of the economics just do not pan out the same way. So compromises are going to have to be made. I'm, I'm not, I hope they do great. I really do. I like this company for the most part, but I am having a hard time seeing how any of these do well in the U S like the Nord original. I was on board. I'm like, okay, you're nobody needs an 865 is my theory. Like even tech savvy early adopters, unless you're a hardcore gamer, you do not need an 865. Like 765 is, is really nice. And the Nord really shows that. Like if you if you played with the Nord, you put them side by side with the OnePlus 8 and you can't tell the difference. It's that good. Yeah, I'm a fan. So I could see how the Nord N10 with a 690 could come close to that. 
and that's kind of where I draw the line. Like below yeah. that, I'm like, where never settle what? Like flagship killer, yes, no. <laughs> I mean, come on. Like, I know that they don't use these models. They still use never settle. So maybe they'll surprise us the N one hundred, but my my hopes are low. When I see the specs, thirteen megapixel rear camera. Any time you see thirteen megapixel on a spec sheet, bad sensor. Mm. Like I just want to tell you, twelve, great. Eight, fine. 16 uh, probably okay like <laughs> 13 is things like fall apart. i have never encountered a 13 megapixel sensor that was good so i think it's some kind of weird samsung sensor and that's the thing like uh maybe i'm wrong maybe it's a sony sensor but oneplus uses sony sensors and that's one of the reasons why their imaging is pretty good because i think sony makes the best sensors and have a really good software stack for these sensors that oems can use so you know, I mean, look, Pixel uses Sony sensors. <laughs> Apple uses Sony sensors. Like, do I need to go on here? So, yeah, I don't know. Like, this N100 is... Ah. Look, I understand that companies change. Like, I wasn't mad when OnePlus went up market with the 8 Pro. That's what I wanted. I wanted mm-hmm. wireless charging. I wanted a $1,000 phone from OnePlus with zero compromises. And I got it for $900. Like, sure, great. Bring it on. And so I wasn't upset about that. And, but, and I'm not sure I'm upset about this, but more like I'm trying to understand the direction, the strategy. Yeah, it's, it's not upsetting so much as it is completely puzzling. And to date, as far as I'm aware, no one at OnePlus has offered like a cogent rationale for why they've gone down market they've like this. They've been super quiet. And the fact that Copay is leaving or left doesn't really help them with their messaging right now. And, and I feel like I'm not worried, but I just want to know. Like, I think I've, the audience also wants to know. Like, if they come out and say, yeah, you know, this is a new strategy. We're, we're deciding that we've, we've matured enough as a company, as a brand, that we want to be in every segment now. And this is what we're doing. And I got to be like, okay, good luck with that. But, I mean, their earbuds are great, you know, and, and they're working on a watch, supposedly. I mean, like, bring it on. I want an ecosystem of OnePlus stuff. That's cool. I'm cool with it. But come out and say it. Explain mm-hmm. yourself, right? Like you owe us that because we've f- supported these people for so long now. You know, and that's that's what drives me up a wall, right? Like no company has enjoyed the sort of like grassroots support that OnePlus has, not in recent memory anyway. And for them to just sort of, as you put it, go quiet and not offer an explanation for this change in strategy, it's. I mean, like, are we probably gonna get over it at some point? Yeah, fine, but. I don't know. I feel like as a company that's devoted itself to its users in a way that OnePlus did, you do kind of owe it to people to just tell us what's up. Yeah. So stay tuned, folks. I'll have that phone at some point. And I'll let you know how I feel about it. A couple of other weird head scratchers of phones, uh, because we have to wrap up. I just want to mention them quickly. Is the FX Tech Pro 1-X. It's called the XDA phone. The and XDA it's just phone. a rehash of that phone we saw at MWC in 2019. Now, I want to be, you know, completely upfront with you folks. Mm-hmm. I advised the company with that initial phone, the original FX Tech Pro one. They came to me and said, hey, you know, we want to launch this phone. It's very niche. Can you advise us on what's good and wrong? Like, put your journalist hat on. Tell us what you think. And I told them not to use an 835 back then. <laughs> and I said, go for a 700 of some kind. Um, but they didn't. And now that thing is you know, just slightly bumped in terms of uh, storage and RAM and has a brand new, beautifully blue anodized casing because it's aluminum, like the original was black. And really, I mean, you know, I know it's a niche phone for people who want to tinker. It has it supports three different OSs, Ubuntu. Um, how do you say that? Lineage. Lineage and Android, of course. And kudos to that. And, you know, it's a nice co-branding. I think, uh, you know, I want to say hats off to Narav for pulling that off uh, because I think it's a really great thing. Yeah, another bit of full disclosure. We were both quite good friends with... Yeah. Uh, I- I, I forget his, I feel terrible for forgetting Chief his exact content title. Officer. Chief content officer at XDA. So of course. congrats to him, but also... Yeah, no, but it's, yeah, like, it's who, like, like, you know that, that gif of uh, Nathan Fillion that goes like... Nyam. <laughs> that's how i feel about that phone right yeah same I, I wish them nothing but the best i hope this works out for them the way that they want it to i i'm probably not going to buy one but yeah lo- love you guys please well, do well apparently they've they've reached their goal on indiegogo so i was gonna say nobody's gonna buy one but maybe i'm wrong the hardware keep on the thing is unreal it's the best i've ever used by far the I best think you've ever used 
Uh, really? Okay, really? maybe Blackberry Bold 9000. I mean, I've got one of those kicking around. Oh, it's still yeah, such yeah. A beauty. I mean, there are some Blackberries in there, but in recent years, you know, nothing can touch this. Sure. The uh, the hinge <laughs> was actually engineered by the same folks who engineered the the same hinge for the Nokia phones back in the day. Yeah. The E7 and stuff. So you know, they they did some things right, but like I look at this phone. It's been two years since, or a year since the original. Two years since the the, the you know I I gave them some advice. And like they never fixed some of the things I suggested, like the fact that the fingerprint sensor on the edge is separate from the power lock key. Like, yeah, <laughs> I, I told them at the time I was like, that's not right. And they're like, yeah, but it's too expensive. We can't change it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, which you know, fine. You know. Like they're they're a startup. They're they're trying to make this yeah. work. I don't think too many of them had a background in this, so it very much felt like a learning experience for everyone no, involved. Look, I think it's amazing that they've gone this far, and con- congrats. But they really need to look at tweaking this going forward if they're going to do another XDA partnership, you know? Like, I think people expect a little more, especially for whatever it is, $800 retail or something. It's a lot of money. I forget, yeah. But yeah. it would have been nice if they had sort of tacked a little sort of teaser for a next device at yeah. the end of that announcement. Just just so we know if there is something more to this than they, they are. It's the Osborne effect, right? People are going to wait for the next one, not buy this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe. Okay, speaking of... Uh, Crazy phones. Uh, Yahoo phone, the Yahoo phone, it's a ZT Blade A3Y. This is a super oh cheap, low-end oh phone, sells for 50 bucks, I think, on a contract with Yahoo Mobile, which is owned Yahoo by Verizon, Mobile. your parent company. <laughs> yeah, so lots of caveats here. I'm not, a, I'm not here to speak on Verizon's behalf at all. Uh, they own Engadget, which employs me, but I can definitively say that this is a terrible idea <laughs> it's a terrible phone i have that hardware i have that phone right now not the yahoo version the, mm-hmm. that phone exists in various variant and there's one for a company called gab wireless which is like a children's phone uh, i won't get into the details because it'll, it'll just rile me up uh it's a terrible piece of hardware that's all i'm gonna say and, and i don't want to be mean to zt but i know what zt can do and even at this price point i think they can do better than this and so it's kind of fitting that this would be the yahoo phone yeah, I've so I have like no inside knowledge into how this phone came to be or, or this partnership at all. But I, I have to assume that people who are still very loyal to the Yahoo brand are probably, I mean, maybe not necessarily getting on in years, but like they've been around for a while. So this phone comes preloaded with the full suite of like Yahoo apps, which I guess is cool. But again, I, I, I personally do not know anyone who lives and dies by Yahoo apps. So to buy a phone based solely around them seems silly, especially when, as you point out, this phone ain't great. Oh, it's, it's, you know, it's your typical ZT prepaid cricket phone. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not, yeah, yeah, it's a burner phone at this point. Like, it's like you buy this phone because, you know, it comes with service for a month and then you throw it in a drawer and you use it over Wi-Fi because you need some sort of internet tablet. And even (laughs) then you like, you drop it. Oh, it went down the sewer. Great. Oh, who cares? You know? Yeah. So it's, it's like... I mean, we can't be too mean because it's really not interesting. But what the, it's the Yahoo angle that I think is interesting. You know, I know a lot of my non-tech friends that still have Yahoo email addresses. I don't know how you can really? still have a Yahoo email address in a day and time and age when Gmail is pretty much omnipotent. But hey, some people, you know, it's like Hotmail. Some people still have Hotmail addresses and use them actively. To anyone out there who still enjoys using Yahoo apps and services, thank you for contributing in some small way to my paycheck. I That's appreciate right. it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but like this very much feels like a situation where Verizon talked to a bunch of hardware providers and was like, hey, we want a phone for Yahoo Mobile. We don't want it to cost a ton of money and we want it to be purple. Can you do this? And ZTE was just like the one that said, yeah, sure. Yeah, but I think they could have done something better for that price. It's, again, it, you know, oh, this could oh, have certainly. been a, like you look at Nokia two point something phones and three point something phones, and you look at what LG is doing, like with their cheap phones. There is so much better you can buy for fifty dollars. Like, and I know I absolutely know that he can do better. That's all you know. You know what the difference is between the Yahoo phone and those phones? No, Yahoo phone's purple. Well, okay, there you go. It's purple. It is a cool color. The one I have is black and it's, it just looks like, it's just like, you know, if you had to like render a phone that was generic for like a, <laughs> an ad, that's exactly what it looks like. All right. Like last topic, cause I want to, we were running out of time, but this one I think is important. The UK is no longer allowing, well, starting in 2021 is not going to allow carriers to sell locked phones anymore. 
Can you imagine a future where this happens in the US? No, obviously not. Wouldn't that be magical? I know it's never going to happen. Magical, absolutely. But we are so territorial that just like broaching the conversations that would get something like this past just like the ideation phase, it simply could not happen It's like here. government oversight, me, 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 communism, socialism, blah, blah, blah. Like, come on, guys. This is the right move. This is where government regulation is important. Like, phones should never be locked, period. Oh, man. Like, especially right now, you're buying them on a payment plan. Mm-hmm. If you stop paying, it's like repossessing your car they they'll come after you the creditors and let's not forget the fact that these people are if you're buying a phone on an installment plan there's a non-zero chance that you return it you trade it in for a new one at some point so you're basically leasing a phone for however many years exactly so uh, anyway this is a good move kudos to the uk uh for putting their foot down with their carriers there there's actually a lot of the carriers already had on their own right sold like stop locking phones so this i think just for vodafone and ee were the only ones left <laughs> but anyway yeah so that's it folks that's that's the show chris you want to tell folks where they can find you on the internet so that they can subscribe to all your thingies sure if for some reason un for some reason completely un understandable to me that you want to see what i'm doing or what <laughs> i'm up to uh you can follow me at chris velasco on twitter or email me at vidangadget.com, which is maybe my favorite way to talk to people. Yeah, I, I love your email address. It's so good. Like, how did you manage to get that? Like, it's it was it was unreal. like the one thing I told them I wanted. That's super I was cool. I was a very bad negotiator, and I got that, <laughs> and I feel great about it. So sweet. Yeah, you should follow Chris's reviews on Engadget and follow him on Twitter as well. And you know where to find me, folks. I'm at Tanker on Twitter. That's T-N-K-G-R-L, like the comic book character without the vowels. It's also the same handle on Instagram, so check that out. Uh, if you want to comment about the podcast, discuss the show with me, make corrections or whatever, please find me on Twitter. Instagram is where you'll find pretty pictures taken with phones and also, pictures of phones. I love taking photos, so check that out as well. There is also a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash mobile tech podcast, where you'll find unboxings, reviews, comparisons, hands-on, mostly unboxings though, because I really like to do unboxing videos. So please subscribe to the channel, like the channel, tell your friends, click the notification bell, comment in the channel, of course. And I want to remind folks, of course, of the new channel, Mobile Tech More. Go to youtube.com right now type mobile tech more check out the two videos we have right there most importantly subscribe like tell your friends all that good stuff thanks for doing that and finally the podcast lives at mobiletechpodcast.com so if you uh, came here today followed chris here and want to subscribe that would be wonderful please consider subscribing at that url also there's an rss feed there if you're old school but we're on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, and pretty much everywhere you can find good podcasts. So again, please subscribe, mobiletechpodcast.com. If your podcasting app supports it, please rate the show, please review the show. It really, really helps. And also there's a donate link in the show notes. The show notes is where you'll find links to all the things we discussed today. So check that out in your podcast app or at mobiletechpodcast.com. But yeah, please use the donate link to donate. It really helps me run the show. This is a bit of a labor of love, as you know, so please consider helping. And I also want to thank our sponsor, Audible. Audible.com is where it's at for audiobooks. If you want to support the show, you can do so by supporting them as well. There's a link in the show notes. I will share it with you in a minute. But basically, Audible is the platform for audiobooks. If you like to read, if you are a bookworm like me, this is where it's at for audiobooks. Sometimes, you know, I'm not really up for reading with my eyes. I want to listen instead. And Audible really delivers. That's what they're good at. So consider helping the podcast by joining Audible. You get a month free trial and you get to keep a book at the end of the trial. So check it out. Audibletrial.com slash mobile tech is URL. That's audibletrial.com slash mobile tech. What I love about Audible is those epic long books that they have, like the Star Wars series, the 11 hours, perfect for a road trip. Sometimes you want something more than, you know, listening to a podcast or two. You want to listen to something that lasts for a while. And that's where they deliver. I love how some of their books are read by the authors. 
You can enjoy all this with Audible. If you're a delivery driver, for example, you know, you can't read because you're driving around all day. Audible.com is your perfect solution to listening to some cool content that's long form. So check them out and support them. AudibleTrial.com slash mobile tech. It'll help us as well. And Chris, I want to thank you for being on the show again. Thank you for having me. It's been a while since we've caught up and this was just nice to kick it a little bit. All right, folks, that's it. Obviously, we'll have another show next week. So stay tuned for that. And until then, cheers, everybody. Bye. This has been the Mobile Tech Podcast with Tank Girl, proudly presented by worldpodcasts.com. You can visit us online at mobiletechpodcast.com.